right, race fans, Brian Eho here and the one and only Bert Lehman. Bert, how's it going this week? Going, going pretty good. Um, uh, got We had uh, some thunderstorms here this weekend, so uh, that's uh, still have snow on the ground, but we had some thunder and lightning and a lot of rain, so. It's better than South Iowa, right? So if you've got any Southern Iowa folks here, prayers to you guys because they got pounded with some tornadoes. Sounds like they had some fatalities down there. We got, I'm up at my folks house here. You can see my background, lots of snow still on the ground. But like literally, I feel like there's like two feet or more still on the ground, not counting the snow banks. So you got rain, we got snow, they got tornadoes, craziness all around, right? I mean, it's a whole lot better than other parts of the country. We'll just leave it at that. Um, but the fact is, we'll take it. No mosquitoes, Bert. Absolutely no mosquitoes <laughs> this time of year. So that's a plus. But uh, I'm telling you what, I'm getting the itch. I mean, racing season's been at full force. It really wasn't an off season. You know, we had uh, for speed weeks down in Florida that seems like it's like two months now. I mean, it used to be just a few weeks, and now it's like really long. And now we're getting into the heart of things. A uh, lot of racing this past weekend, um, all classes, you know, modified. There was World of Outlaw Sprints. There was late models. We'll touch on some of that. We'll touch on some recaps there. Got some news in the Wasota world. We got our blast of the past. And, uh, well, let's get to it. Episode number 119, of course, brought to you by Dirt Track Supply. Big thanks to, of course, Trevor and Ron over there in Watertown, South Dakota, home of the Aero Chassis. I know, I know Trevor's chomping at the bit. He's actually getting ready, Bert. He's heading down to Bristol again. I hope he has a little better luck than he had last year. He said he had a blast. But looking forward to seeing Trevor in that Aero chassis down at Bristol. And uh, speaking of him kind of going south, we got to get him to the Dome, right? TPO went to the Dome, won. Trevor Anderson stole some wins from him at the Casino Speedway. So we got to get Trevor Anderson to the Dome. We might have to put a push on that throughout the season here. But a huge thanks to them over at Dirt Track Supply. But let's start with some local racing news, off-season news, right? Because there's no racing locally quite yet. But let's start with a little news. So looking at it here, Bert, um, the first thing I want to touch on is we've been critical. I've been really critical of Wasoda over the like two years that we've been doing this show. Like they can't do nothing right, right? I tell you what, I got to give a tip of the cap to Wasoda because arguably right now, if you're thinking super late model racing in, in the Wisconsin, Minnesota, kind of the, the region where there's a lot of Wasoda cars, What's the biggest show right now that you can think of um, coming up other than the Gopher 50 that's been going along, on a long time, but the biggest paying show, not the USA Nationals, but there's another one, new one. In, in Wisconsin? Yep. I, I would say the Outlaw Weekend, uh, Mississippi Thunder. Yep, Dairyland Showdown. <clears throat> so I was looking at the schedule, right, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, right? They are literally running – the opening weekend of the Challenge Series, which has been struggling. They're trying to revamp that. They got some plans there. That was scheduled against, right, the Dairyland Showdown 50 grand to win. Well, all them Wisconsin cars, right, you look at Jesse Glenn's, you look at a lot of them Wisconsin guys, you know where they're going. Giassi, they're probably going on to Mississippi Thunder. They, they guaranteed they would not be going to the Challenge Series. And lo and behold, I'm thinking about it. Next thing you know, they made a change. I talked to Jeff Krause. He's on the board at the Viking Speedway. And he said, hey, they changed the challenge series. So they became aware of it. The new executive director stepping in, which is Rod Lindquist, actually realized there was an issue, quickly reacted to that issue, made a change, rescheduled the opening weekend for the challenge series, and it is no longer on top of the Dairyland Showdown for that, I mean, that's an A-plus right there, right? I mean, that is that is phenomenal. That is just really looking at a problem, fixing it, moving forward. I, I'm thinking things are heading in the right direction. I'm pretty excited about that. they got a long way to go. they got things to fix. They're aware of that. But uh, I'm, I'm pretty happy. That was, that was pretty cool to see in a world right now, Bert, where it seems like everybody schedules on top of everybody. Wissota got that one right. So hats <laughs> off to them. Another thing that happened in the late model world, you know how they always say the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? <clears throat> so veteran Pat Doerr, arguably probably had one of the best years he had last year. Not a pile of wins, but 
seemed like he got second like every single night, right? Like every night. I guarantee he wouldn't wear a bridesmaid's dress because he got second and they would have even paid him to wear it at the ABC Raceway. And he wasn't going to wear it for money, so we couldn't get him to wear one for free. I promise you that. But, man, he had a good year. So last year, Bert, watching the Wasota Late Models, there's kind of been a little bit of a surge of these 525 crate engines, okay? Dave Moss has one. He's been very fast. Ryan Michelson's got one. He's been fast. Derek Vessel, arguably the fastest guy in northern Minnesota, he's been fast. All of them have 525 crates. Highly competitive. Fastest car at the Wasota 100 <coughs> was Dave Moss. Now, I don't know if Jimmy Mars maybe put it in kind of coast mode and protect mode when he got the lead and, and Moss chased him down and just didn't have quite enough, but he was quick. I mean, he was, if he wasn't the fastest car on the track, he was the second fastest for sure. Well, they made a, a rule change and I don't want to say was someone made a rule change. It was the process, right? Like they, they voted on it as a, as a, you know, association at the annual meeting to literally give the 525 crate engines 200 more RPM. And they took 300 RPM away from the Wissota late model spec engines. That's a 500 RPM swing. In my mind, watching them over the last couple of years, I don't think it was necessary for a change at all. They're already fast. First and second at the, at the Gondick Law Speedway in Port Pointsburg, Derek Vessel, Mike Belfi, both of them 525 crates. They don't need any more, right? They don't need any more. <clears throat> well, once that happened, Pat Doerr was like, this is complete and utter a bunch of nonsense. And he got on the phone and he started calling drivers, promoters with soda. And, and literally he got enough interest that they had a vote. They, they gave the 525s. They got to keep their 200 RPM, but they gave the 300 RPM back to the spec engines. Good move, uh, unnecessary change. I mean, it was really unnecessary. No reason to change that rule um, over the last, over this past winter. Um, I talked to promoters, it's kind of crazy. And I literally talked to promoters and you know what they said? Well, we didn't realize that we did that. Bert, how is that possible, right? That's, that's the answer I got. They're like, well, we knew that we were giving them a little bit more. We didn't realize we were taking it away. It's like, it's like people go to the meetings and they're just kind of going through the motions of like, yeah, okay, well, I'll vote. Not, are they, it's like they're not paying attention. With that said, <clears throat> I think they got it right now. They made a change. Thank God. Good job to Pat Door on making that happen. But when, when things like that happen, do you think there's a benefit to having maybe just a rules committee, right? They're like, hey, we're making the rules rather than bringing it to a vote from the association when half of them clearly aren't paying attention, a bunch of them don't even show up to the meeting to begin with. So some of them aren't even there supporting their drivers. Half of them that are there supporting them are like, well, whatever, I'll just vote. However, if they're not taking it seriously and they got enough to do running their tracks, is, is that system maybe due for a change? I mean, I, I think the system is definitely flawed and I can see how it can happen because, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, um, if your track is part of Wasoda, you, you have a vote on the rule changes. So if your, you, if your track has that particular clause. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, you can, you can have a promoter at a track who is, you know, his main focus is promoting his track, but he has a vote. So he doesn't know the ins and outs of a particular the technicalities of some of the rules and the impact they'll have on a division so yeah like you said they may just be going along with everybody else or you know you know they can't make an informed decision because they don't know enough information about what they're voting on <laughs> that's their own fault though no right? i agree i agree because here's <laughs> So I'm going to give, again, I've been critical of Bill Engelstead a lot, a lot, right? A lot. But one thing he ran, he was a president at the, at the Hibbing Raceway for several years, right? And one thing, we had a very strong association there for a number of years. And always, Bill would always go to the meetings and 100% of the time he would vote however the association wanted him to vote. Bill Engelstead never sat back and says, well, 
I don't agree with what they said at our meeting. I'm just voting this way. He never did that. He voted exactly how the association. So the process has always been this. During the course of the year, promoters, you need to be having communication with your driver. And I get it. Drivers are going to come to you complaining about this and that and the other. But start writing stuff down. They, they then are able to propose rule changes to Wissota on behalf of the track, behalf of the drivers. They On that proposal, they put why the rule needs to be changed, what are the benefits, what are the, you know, whatever, how do they want it worded, and then that gets on the agenda. And then towards the end of the year, that agenda gets sent out to all the promoters, okay? Now, the process, and I get it because people are busy or trying to run your tracks, half of them got race cars, I get it, right? But the process is supposed to be take your agenda, talk to the drivers in each of those classes that race your track, and, and Get some feedback, get educated, understand what, what the situation is so you can make an informed decision and vote on behalf of your drivers. Some tracks are excellent at that. Some tracks, literally, they get the agenda, they don't look at it until they get to the meeting and raise their hand. You know, and I, I don't know which ones are which. I know that I, I've been fortunate to be part of some of them that were really, really good, okay? Now, <clears throat> so when they get there, they know what they're going to be voting on. They, they already know this, right? So I don't understand why. It's just, it just shows me that maybe it's a lack of interest or, or whatever. Maybe people are busy. There's only so much time in a day. But the system, the intent is there. But I think the system is flawed. And maybe it's time for a couple changes in that regard. So, But uh, needless to say, with Soda Late Models, you're getting, uh, the, if you had a spec motor, you're getting your 300 RPMs back. So, Breathe easy. If you have a spec, call Pat Door. Thank him. Don't rough him up because he did you a favor. Okay. Now, the next thing I'm going to touch on here is a little bit of an announcement. And uh, I call it the NL NLRA region, right? <clears throat> Which is, you know, kind of Grand Forks, uh, Ada, Devil's Lake, Winnipeg, kind of up in that area. That's the NLRA region. Okay. So, Ada, Norman County Raceway in Ada. They announced today five Wissota Late Model shows on the schedule for next year. They've always had like one or two, probably two NLRA shows, but they're having five. Cheyenne Speedway down in Lisbon, North Dakota, Burt, they have 10 late model shows on the schedule. 10. So they run on Sundays. I'm going to be honest with you, three of them are like in April, and I think that there's no way on planet Earth that them are happening, right? So they'll probably have seven. But the question I have for you is this, <clears throat> is those additional races, in addition to the ability to cross the border and maybe race Winnipeg on a Thursday, do you think a guy like Shane Edgington could be the, the favorite, the preseason favorite to win a national title in 2022? Well, I mean, definitely the more shows, the more opportunities that you have to race gives you a better opportunity to win the championship because you can, um, you know, throw out your bad shows. You have more opportunities to throw out your bad shows, the more opportunities you have to race. Yeah. And it don't matter how many cars they have, right? Because I've talked to some drivers and they're like, well, we'll see what they pay. It don't matter if they get three cars or four cars, a first place, if you have three cars and they ain't going to get that, there's enough support in that area. They're not going to have three car features, but the fact is them, them shows right there. I'm telling you, don't matter how many cars are there. That is going to be a huge advantage for maybe him. I can see maybe a guy like Cole Schill running four nights a week, possibly. Um, he had a rough year last year, but I think he's due for a rebound. You know, there's some drivers up in that area that if they put their nose to the grindstone, they can get after it. I mean, Dustin Strand is a former national champ, right? So there's a guy right there. He's had a bad year. I don't see the 71 having two bad years in a row. I just don't see it. So he could be a possibility. You know, nothing against the northern Minnesota guys and the guys out in South Dakota. Then we're kind of the main spots. And the Wisconsin guys really don't have too much of a chance because they, there's not a lot of tracks in their area. they got to travel, so it's a little tougher. And they run Cedar Lake typically on Saturdays. And uh, stay tuned. <clears throat> Challenge series schedule coming out this week, Bert. There's going to be – there sounds like there might be some pretty interesting stuff on the Challenge series schedule. Stay tuned for that. I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag, but I'm pretty excited. If what I'm hearing is true, 
it's huge. It's huge. And I'm excited for it. So what do you say we jump into a blast from the past brought to you by Impact Health Sharing? So self-employed uh, people, farmers, truckers, if you're paying for your own insurance and you feel like the gas prices are kicking my tail, I like I need to save some money somehow, and maybe healthcare is one of them places, give me a call. I've been able to help a lot of people cut theirs in about half. Um, anywhere you want, you can go to the doctor. There's no network or anything. Um, shoot me a message, shoot me a text, uh, 218-969-1380. I'll get you a free quote. Um, no obligations. If I can help you out, that'd be great. Uh, we're all looking to keep some money in our pocket. So episode number 119, okay? You said you don't have any 119s. Correct. I have, I have two, okay? One of them, a good buddy of mine, <clears throat> down from central Minnesota, used to race at the KRA Speedway, raced over at Gro Grove Creek, Robbie Byery. He ran modifies, he ran mod fours, he ran late models. And uh, I texted him, I tried to get some info, like, what's your best memory with the 119? I remember him saying he had a hell of a race over at the Brown County Speedway. I don't remember all the details with it, but uh, Robbie Byery, the 119, owns Hutch Auto and Truck Parts, sponsors sponsors cars, he sponsors races. So he's been heavily involved with racing for many, many years. So shout out to my buddy, Robbie. But I got a quiz for you. Got one for you, buddy. Clue number one. It's not dirt. This is from Jeff, by the way. Jeff put this together. Got to give credit where credit's due. It's not dirt, but well-known guy in eastern Wisconsin. Clue number two, he's from Mosinee, just south of Wausau. Clue number three, Coleman Machine was the primary sponsor on this race. Well, Dalton Zier raced 119, the Coleman car. Um, he did, he did. And, um, and I think that is the same car, okay? <clears throat> this guy here, former Artco champ, former ASA champ, raced against Pete Wallers, all of us northern guys, um, 1990 and 91, was Soda Superstock National Champion, raced uh -huh. against him in 95, and raced against the Iceman, Jimmy Mars, in 1999. I don't know. Kevin Sawinski. Oh, okay. You He's remember that? Name, okay? Yeah, yes. I, I don't know the situation, but evidently he was in that 119 car. And I, I looked it up, but there was pictures of it. So I'll post them on here yeah. for those to see. I, I, I'm more I'm for, more familiar with him racing the number one car. Uh, but yeah, I'm sure he raced the 119 because uh, I believe Coleman Products is from Upper Michigan and our... And I think Sawinski's from Michigan also. Yeah, he, uh, Mosinee, Wisconsin, I think. But that's what Jeff put down. I, I don't know that. Oh. He put okay. that together. But needless to say, Jeff Stump Burt. I love it. I love it. <laughs> so, um, number 19, I'll start with you. I know you said you got a few of them there. Um, leave the – let's just start with them. I mean, if there's a 19, right, like uh, automatically we're on the same page who, who's the when you think 19 in dirt racing who do you think of i mean obviously it's steve larson um you know that's pretty much i mean yeah when you think of 19 you think of steve larson there's no question a six-time labor day shootout <laughs> winner this guy's won a, won a pile of races i called him i, I was doing uh the redraw at at the challenge series so labor day shootout and I said, the ageless wonder, Steve Larson. He goes, you little son. Like he, he's like, I'm going to get you for that one. I, I rattled his cage a little bit. I saw him the next day, and he come over and give me a big bear hug. He goes, easy with that now. But it sounds like he has everything for sale. Like, I, I think that as it sits right now, he's planned on, like, that's it. I think he's planning on being done, which, I mean, he's been racing for a long time. He's been around I mean, and he's had several numbers. He was 9, 46, 19, 519. Of course, his, his late father, Russ Larson, 
who they have the Russ Larson Classic after at the Gondek Law Speedway in Superior. And then, of course, Brent Larson was 0-2. That's his brother, um, was his brother. So just a huge racing family. Been doing it for a long time. And I got to interview him one day. I got to, I literally got to, I think I need to get to his place and just sit there for an afternoon and just talk well, it, a pile it, of stories. You you better plan for an afternoon because it'll it'll take an afternoon. I interviewed him for a story for uh, Dirt Late Model magazine and um I actually uh interviewed him in the pits prior to the first uh Dwayne Mater memorial race. And uh yeah I mean the interview was like 45 minutes to an hour. You know a lot of times the interviews I do are like, you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And uh, this one was like 45 minutes to an hour. But I mean, yeah, I mean, he just had some great stories. Uh, you know, I um, I mean, you mentioned that he he's raced many years and he has. And, um, you know, he had a really bad accident at Cedar Lake Speed. I don't remember the year. I think it was early 2000s where he barrel rolled down the front stretch at uh, Cedar Lake. Um, from what I remember, he told me was somehow his car caught that, you know, where underneath the flag stand where the people walk out onto the track, somehow his car caught that opening and then flipped him down the the rest of the front of the straightaway. And he, he broke his back or broke something in his back because he was telling me like they, they mounted a TV on the ceiling. Uh, so he could watch TV because, you know, he was, he was, you know, he couldn't, he was in bed and he couldn't really move. So they mounted a, a TV on the ceiling so he could watch TV. And, um, you know, he had, uh, you know, he talked about when uh, uh, he raced for uh, Pete Parker, you know, this was back, I would say probably early nineties, him and Pete Parker had you know, the cars were looked identical except for the numbers. He had number 19 and Pete had number 10. And, uh, you know, he had, you know, nothing but kind words to say for, about Pete. And, uh, but uh, you got to ask him about when he raced at uh, Monster Hall and had the, the sprint car wing on his, oh, on, great. on the roof of his car, because it was a run what you brung show. And, you know, um, he had, motor issues so he had to start the b i think he started last in the b and he won the b and then he had to start in the back of the a and he just put a spanking on the field because nobody could touch him with that wing and he had i believe he had a sprint car tire uh on the rear of the car also or it was an old tire uh that they were using the tire to drop fuel drums from the pickup truck you know you put a tire there to, to cushion the to cushion the fall and um, uh, they used that tire and it's just a great story because like he said, he parked next to, next to Brian Burkhofer and, uh, Burkhofer was kind of complaining about his setup and stuff, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, that guy right there, that's a guy that I have to interview because I've, I've known him for a long time and, and he's always been super fun to talk to. He's the kind of guy that, you know, he's kind of got that, like, that demeanor where if you catch on a bad moment, he's going to let you have, right. But you you catch him on most days and he's pretty fun to talk to him. And he ran for Lonsky, him and slammer, Steve Eggersdorf had the, he had the three E he had the, um, Steve had the 19 Steve Larson. So they both had red cars that year. So he's had so many different people he raced with. He was kind of a, I think he was a teammate with Kreiderman at one point, you know? So, I mean, there's a lot of history there with Steve Larson. Who else do you got? Um, well, I'll go with my, uh, the one from Eastern Wisconsin. Uh, this driver still races. He races, uh, well, he raced the IMCA stock car last year, but now he's back in the IMCA modified, but he did race late models for two or three years, uh, probably eight years ago or so. But, uh, Jeremy Hedrick from, uh, Embarrass, uh, which is just, you know, five miles from Shano. Um, okay. but yeah, he used to race, uh, a late model uh like i said though he's back in the imca modified uh he's he's posted on f- facebook he's got his mod ready because he's going down the bristol um last year he went down the bristol with his imca stock car and he wound up selling it down there <laughs> that's a win so. there's something left to sell because a few people didn't have their cars they, they could there's nothing left to sell you reckon mm-hmm. that you reckon so that, mm-hmm. that's pretty cool who else you got 
Um, the other one I have is a Western Wisconsin driver. I don't, I'm pretty sure he doesn't race anymore, but uh, Paul Brust. Um, the Brust name was, of course, popular. Him and Porky, I, think, I believe Porky was 49. They both ended up running late models a little bit. I remember Porky more on the modifieds. I know he had a weight modified. And then Paul Brust, like you mentioned earlier, white car. I don't know if we got a picture. I don't know if I have a picture of that one. But a white car, they had purple numbers on it. Purple they? numbers, I believe, yes. Yeah. yeah, I think they they were kind of, I don't know where they were from, kind of the Rice Lake area. Or they ran Rice Lake more than anything. I know they ran Cedar Lake a little bit, but I feel like um, Paul Brust ran Rice Lake quite a bit when they had late models, didn't they? I, I, believe, I believe so. Yeah. So I have I have a few here, and, and one of them here, one of my old sponsors, this guy here, I may have been responsible for him missing like a whole lot of school, right? But Mike Mackey, he ran a hobby stock. He only raced for a year, you know, and then he got a super, never got it on the track. There's a whole other story to that, right? But the fact is, um, he ran a hobby stock. He had the 19, right? He's actually um, related. You remember uh, Mike and Mark Chamernick, right? Yes. He's, he's related to the Chamernicks. So he actually pitted for me. His dad sponsored me. He sponsored me. And uh, Mike's been a good friend of mine for a long, long time. So shout out to my buddy, Mike. And then another one here, four generations of racing in this family, Ryan Revord. He ran a super stock up at the Superior, was Superior Speedway at the time. Now it's, of course, the Gondick Law Speedway. But I remember his dad racing, his grandpa raced. I don't remember his grandpa racing, but everybody in the Superior area sure does. And then now there's a fourth generation of Revords out there. So a historic name over in Superior, Wisconsin. And then I got another one for you. Number 19, Southern Minnesota. I think Rochester, I think, is where they're from. Um, his dad was Dick Sorensen. I think 74 was, was Dick. And then his kid, who that's what I'm talking about here. I remember him mostly in a modified when it was with soda modifieds down at Cass and Deer Creek. And, and uh, what else ran down there? Chateau. They all ran. Uh, St. Charles had a track. So he ran a Wasoda mod at the time. And his kid right now is arguably like one of the top up and comers in the U.S. NPS ranks. And we'll talk about him more in a little bit. Mike Sorensen. Yep. Yep. And uh, he had a, he had always had sharp looking stuff. Yeah. Um, he guess, raced the late model. He raced the late model for a little bit. Yeah, he did. He did. I remember him mostly in a mod. I don't remember him a whole lot in the late model. And I think it's because I was so laser focused on my own racing mm -hmm. in the super uh, stock when he jumped into the late model. I remember when there was a challenge series race at Shano Speedway uh, one year. Uh, Sorensen was there. Mike Sorensen was there in a late model. Okay. And then I got another one here. And I don't know what's happened to this guy. I don't know if he's still around, but Davey Mastorf. So we talk about Kevin Burdick um, as far as super stock being fantastic race car driver. His father-in-law is Bill Matsdorf, and I believe Davey Matsdorf would have been a nephew to Bill Matsdorf. And I remember him racing in the Jack's Pizza number 19 affordable back in the late 90s. He got after it. He was a pretty good wheel man. Didn't seem like he raced for real long, but when he was out on the track, he won a bunch of races. And, and I don't know if he's still around. I haven't heard hide or hair of Davey Matsdorf for a long time. So, Bert, let's jump into the next segment here. The super late model segment brought to you by Brad Parson, who offers soil health and fertilizer efficiency products. So farmers, it's that time of year. The snow is about ready to be off. It's time to start planting. Hopefully you got what you need, but if you don't get a hold of Brad, um, he can help you save money and increase yields. 15 year track record in Minnesota and the Dakotas and uh, I tell you what, this is this is what you're looking to do. You're looking to be profitable. You want to increase yields. You want to save money. He can help you do both. And farmers, if you're not using his products, someone someone in your area probably is. So get a hold of Brad Parson. But a lot of late model racing this last weekend. No major national touring series, right? No World of Outlaw, no Lucas, none of that. Ton of local, ton of, I don't want to say local, but regional series and kind of like regional events. And what we're going to do here is I'm going to bring up the event and then we can maybe touch quickly on who won, right? Not a big deal. We can just mention that. And then I want you to think of a word or a phrase or just some kind of like automatically what came to mind from that particular event. 
So the first one I'm going to look at here is Schaefer Spring Nationals, which is, of course, Ray Cook series, right? So Ray Cook put this series together. He has a Spring Nationals and I think the Fall Nationals. And the first night, Friday night, they ran at Swainsboro. What comes to mind from Swainsboro? Uh, Brandon Overton back on track. <laughs> and the configuration of that track, that track looks really flat. And it looks kind of oblong. Maybe it was just a camera angle. I don't know. It looked kind of oblong to me. I say narrow. That the too, yes. Really narrow. So as big as it was, as fast as it was, it seemed like there, I mean, not only was there not a wide racing groove, it just like didn't seem very wide in general. So it seemed really easy to get yourself in trouble, but you hit spot on. Brandon Overton back on track, 10,053 after a really, really, I don't want to say miserable, but he was slumping there at the end of speed weeks. Good to see that 76 back in victory lane. How about the next night? They went to Sonoya, Georgia. Um, Shane Clanton. It was fun watching Shane Clanton dice his way through traffic. I mean, he lap had some. Traffic. Lap yeah, traffic. lap traffic. That's <laughs> what I mean. Yeah, I mean, he had some moves where cars were racing side by side in front of him and entering the corner, he would. There was just enough room for his car to go in between them, and he made it fit. Bert, with, with like eight <clears throat> laps to go, whatever, somewhere in that vicinity at the end, there was a caution, right, 53-lap feature. And he was on the rear bumper of sixth place. And yep. fourth, fifth, and sixth were all right in the group, right? And, and I think it was Ashton Winger got a flat. He was running yep. second. He got yep. a flat and pulled off. Now, had Ashton Winger, like, stay, if they stayed green, he pulled in the infield, would it have been possible for Shane Clanton to lap up to third, maybe not second, because that person had a little bit of gap. I think that was Michael Page, I think it was. Maybe, maybe I don't remember. Let's see. Who was it that got second that night? It was uh, Dylan Knowles. Dylan Knowles got second at Sonoya. So I don't know if you would have lapped Dylan Knowles. But I mean, it was. It was definitely possible he could have lapped through a third place. Yeah, I mean, it was <laughs> unbelievable. Um, absolutely. So so that stuck out to you. Let's just call it a Shane Clanton ass kicking. That has to be the best I've seen him in a while. Like, he was on it. And, and some of them three wide passes through lap traffic, I'm like, what is he doing? <laughs> he's a half a track. Literally, he's a half a track ahead. And he's chucking sliders and elbowing people out of the way. I'm going, oh, my God. If he if he wrecks himself and looks back at the tape, he's going to be really upset because he had no reason to be doing that. But it was fun to watch, for sure. But what stuck out to me was unbelievable facility and packed. I mean, jam-packed. There wasn't – I mean, it was literally elbows to assholes in that stands. I mean, it was absolutely packed all the way around. Really nice facility. For some reason, I remember watching it last year. And it was bone dry top to bottom. It was really dark, and it didn't seem with the light. Something was different. It just seemed like, like holy cow! It kind it, of it, me see the lake of old. The, the video seemed darker uh, this year. time than it than it. No, this, oh, this year it seemed darker. Yeah, it was kind of dark. Um, but I was impressed. I mean, they put on a hell of a show there. The racing was good. It's a little bit top dominant, but you can kind of go wherever. But it was, it was actually really fast, high-paced racing. They had a long stretch without a yellow flag. So the next one I got here, um, so Sunday night, they went to the Cherokee Speedway Southern All-Star event down in Gaffney, South Carolina. What stuck out at Cherokee? Well, you said Sunday night. Was it at night? Uh, they raced? <laughs> and it, was pretty, it, was, it was pretty light out when they were racing, and the track showed – had the typical daytime racing um racing <laughs> i i honestly bert don't know that i've ever seen a good race there i'm so disappointed right because for years i heard cherokee speedway right so in my mind i'm like this place is legendary I've heard about this place forever and i've I watched a lot of races there's so few over the last couple of years and it's the same nonsense 87 classes start at noon one lane on the bottom, rubbers up, 
caution after caution the last five laps because people are blowing tires. Just incredibly disappointing and tough break for uh, for Fergie. Fergie. I mean, he really had it locked up, in my opinion. I mean, he, he was going to win that race, and right rear tire goes down. With yeah, there were, there were, there was two laps left when his when his tire blew. Right, and uh, then Overton blew a tire later on. And um, one thing that stuck out to me too was uh, Chris Madden uh, uh, was not afraid to use his car in that race. <laughs> Nor is he ever. But that, that's why we kind of like watch them. So it is what it is. Uh, although I, I did look in the crowd, and it would be nice to be able to sit in a grandstand right now in short sleeve shirts like they were. <laughs> it was packed. It was packed. I mean, I just uh, another just unbelievable crowd. And, and I just watched that. I saw some threads online and people are like, this place sucks. You know, like and, and like actual late model drivers posting basically and not so many words like these guys don't have a clue. And there was people that were clearly from down there that were like mad. Like they're they're like, they, these are fighting words. Don't be knocking our track. And it's like, if you guys actually saw a good race, you'd really be excited. Like as excited as they are for that, I can't imagine if they saw a good race there. Um, disappointing. Hopefully, at some point we can see a good one. I think we're due to see a good race at Cherokee. There's still plenty. They got the Rock Belt Memorial coming up. They got some big stuff coming up. Hopefully, we can catch a good one. It, it hasn't been really good from what I've seen. So let's jump on. Uh, let's go down to Clarksville, Tennessee. They had the Toilet Bowl, a two-night event down there, three grand and seventy-five hundred. What stuck out from the old Toilet Bowl in Clarksville? A strong performance from Dennis Herb Jr. Uh, he won the Plunger Night, which is the Friday night show, and then uh, finished second uh, the following night. And he got passed after some contact with uh, uh, Hedgecock. And yeah, Hedgecock got it done, right? Because Hedgecock actually won both. He won the crate late model feature and the main late model feature in Herb. I mean, a first and a second, solid weekend. Probably the best speed weeks that he's had. And then kind of carrying that momentum. He could be a guy to beat down with the Rev here this weekend. Um, I, I got, checked him in the first night. <laughs> you, you did? Okay, okay. So I got two things. I'm not sure. Maybe not quite so PG here. Um, I'm just going to say titties. Um, I just am. Right, because it's Clarksville, and Clarksville's the track, right, where they were the little controversy. Duck River won the oh. David C. first the race, and Clarksville's like, "Hey, come on, have at it!" Not only Bert, not only were they like, "Hey, you guys come on up here," they had like that frisky motorsports, them chicks or whatever. They were like, they took the mic from Pit Row TV, and they were going around interviewing drivers, and they were doing photo shoots and going, <laughs> "Wow, they're." Uh, over and under, over and under on on drivers or pit guys getting punched by their wives. I'm gonna go with. That, <laughs> right? I'm a, so I'm, I'm telling you, like everybody knows what's going on, and guys are going like, "I don't, honey, I'm not looking." Uh, uh-uh, uh, nope, don't, definitely not. Trouble all the way around. Um, but unique, unique trophy, right? Yes. They, they leave with a toilet, which is, you know, I, I'm all about unique trophies. Everybody's got. You know, that's won some races. You got the three post, the four post. You got them kind of trophies, but they leave with a toilet, like a like a actual. I don't know if it's a real toilet, but it's a, looks like a toilet anyway. I guess I I don't remember how big it is, but they have the golden toilet. They got different toilets or whatever for different classes. And I read a little story. I'm like, how the hell did they come up with a toilet bowl? Well, when the guy decided that he was gonna buy the track, somebody says you, you're just basically flushing your money right down the shitter. Perfect. We'll call it the toilet bowl. And that's how it all happens. So kind of a unique deal over in Tennessee. And uh, <clears throat> the next one, and you said you didn't get a chance to watch this. You, you didn't watch Boot Hill, did you? Boot Hill, I did not see. Yeah, pretty good racing overall. Um, I don't know if I have the results in front of me. You can look them up online. Um, but what I'm going to say about Boot Hill, actually, uh, Brian Rickman won the main night over there. Or he won one night. Um, Tyler Stevens won the, the main night, did not even make the feature the first night, and he won the second night. Super sandy, kind of racy, a little bit high, a little bit low, but it was, I'm telling you, it was a sand pit. Provenzino told me when I went down to Milton, it was like racing in a gravel pit. 
that's exactly what Boot Hill looked like is racing in a gravel pit. So quite the sandy uh, track there. And was that was that it? Oh, Smoky Mountain. Smoky Mountain. Smoky Mountain. Yeah. Yep. What stuck uh, on Smoky Mountain? Overton cruises to another victory. <laughs> Overton got her done. You know, I'm gonna say stacked field, right? For a non woo or Lucas or Flow Racing Night or whatever, for just kind of a base. I don't, I don't know if you know if it was sanctioned. A really stacked field, good field of cars, and I mean it was almost like the whole Lucas Oil field. Not maybe all of them, but pretty darn close to all of them were there. So really stacked field at the Tennessee tip off at Smoky Mountain racing. What would you think on the racing? Um, I mean, it was all right. Uh, nothing spectacular. Uh, I mean, Overton started uh, in the front or very near the front. And what, once he was in the lead, nobody really challenged him. Yeah, he was gone. So, I mean, really, Overton got a flat right at, at Cherokee. So he won or not. Yeah, at Cherokee. He got Cherokee, a flat. Yes. So he won two. He won the first two on the weekend, went to Cherokee, probably should have got second. Because I yep. think he, he was in second when he got the flat. He wouldn't have got by Matt, and there was just no passing. But he went from having two wins in a second to two wins in a flat. Good weekend for Overton. So after Cherokee, right? Well, um, and I, I just want to say one thing about Overton. I mean, and one thing I like about Overton is he doesn't just settle. I mean, he, even though Cherokee was a one-laner, he would – in the last few laps, he tried to make that high side work on the restarts. Yeah. And uh, he actually had a run on Madden that one lap and Madden kind of squeezed him up into the wall on the back stretch. No, you're making stuff up. Now, <laughs> you got to, you got to quit this, right? <laughs> no, you're right. I mean, he's, he's that kind of guy. He's fun to watch where if he feels like he's got a good hot rod, he's going to be searching all over the track. And, and that's why he wins a bunch of races. He ain't going to just settle and fall into second. As a racer, I always said, I'd rather get fifth trying to win than get second and just follow and, and just say, well, I should have tried. So you always got to try. And if it's just not there, it's not there. You might go back a couple spots. No, don't be stupid and go back 12th, right? <laughs> you know, but, you know, so they got to have a little common sense there. But after Cherokee, there was a lot of banter on Facebook, right, about do we need to have 50 lap races? 50, 60, whatever. I think it was 50 laps at Cherokee. 50 or 53, yes. One, it's something like that. Yeah, I'm looking here, and I don't know if I have it down as far as, but it was, yeah, it was it was a bunch. Do they do they need to have field? So, I actually posted on Facebook, and I said, maybe we should, maybe we should actually document, start documenting, keeping track, right? Like, what lap are these tracks locking down rubbered up? Right. Well, and Cherokee was lap five. <laughs> I think it was a lap five of the parade lap. Right? I mean, it was right away. And I look back at all the other races, and none of the other ones did. And all of them were like 50 laps. Right. So I looked mm -hmm. at all the other races, none of them. And one of them didn't even, I think it was Swainsboro, didn't even really start cleaning off until about lap 35. And then this outside started coming in, and somebody was up battling in the top five and smoked the wall. But you look at some of these races, and, and we all know what they are, right? There's there's certain challenge series races. There's certain races for the Dirt Kings that, you know, if you go to this track, it's going to be rubber up. It's just, it just is what it is. Is it best for the series director at that point to say, look, we're, we're going to track A, right? People can, you, you can insert your own track, okay? Because... I'm not going to do that right now. But we all know certain tracks that just rubber up every single time you're there. Should the series say, look, we ain't running a 40 lap feature on this track, right? We're going to run 25. If you if this race goes great for 25 laps, maybe we'll try 30 at the next one if you want to go longer. But is, is there some common sense that needs to come on with let's let's quit making these races so long, especially when we know it's going to be locked down? What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can do that if there's a history behind the race and, you know, if there's several years where, yeah, after so many laps, the track is just going to lock up. I mean, like in um, um, Cherokee, um, you know, it's a day race, so 
And like you said, yeah, I mean, it was a one lane track when they were on their parade laps. And so Ferguson probably wishes it was <laughs> less laps because 45 led, laps, 46 laps. He wins that race. Yep. He, I mean, he led the majority of the race and, uh, you know, came up with, you know, one up finishing near the back because he blew a tire with two laps to go. Right. And, um, you know, I think in instances like that, you can do that. Um, now, it, it depends how the track is prepped. Now, I mean, because you had mentioned uh, the one track where it took like 35 laps to clean clean off. Um, you know, I'm just going to use the USA Nationals as an example because I go there every year. And they always farm the track before the race. So, I mean, the first 40 to 50 laps is just, you know, high speed there's not really a lot of passing because they're cleaning off the track basically, but the last 50 is what you really want to see. Right. Right. And, and see, and, but they've proven it, right. They right. Cedar Lake Speedway. They've been doing a hundred lap race for a while and they've been doing it well. Right. I'm not saying everything's perfect. Right. But they, they, they play with it during the year. So they kind of know what they got. So they have a good track record, right? We, we kind of know what we're getting there for the most part, unless there's extenuating circumstances of some kind. And then you have certain tracks that a series comes, right? And like the last five times in a row, it's literally locked down rubber in the heat races. Well, either A, just don't go there anymore because it's stupid, right? Or B, be like, look, we're, you're on a, we're on a 20 lap feature. It's all we're on. And they'll be like, well, what are you talking about? It's all we need. 20 laps. That's it. We're getting to go 20 laps. Because at some point, the drivers, nobody wants to watch 30, 50 laps at Cherokee. Nobody wants to watch cars just follow each other around like train, like a train track. If you know it's going to be locked up, and this is on the on the on the promoters, because if you hit the nail on the head. I don't think all races are necessarily too long if the track is prepped properly. Right. Right. But if the track's not prepped properly, it's one of those deals where some some promoters are going to be like, hey, we screwed up. We screwed up and we're going to fix this and we're going to make it better next time. And they make an honest effort to do that. Some tracks you go there, it's the same garbage every single time. In that case, I think option A is just to be like, look, we, we want no part of that. You, you know, you have a great deal. You do your own thing, but we're not coming until you fix it. Or B we're running way less laps because it is complete and utter nonsense running on 40 laps. So I think, uh, I think that's something for serious promoters to really, really think about. And, you know, you think on the local level, maybe not so much with super late models, but you think about with like modifieds or local, local late models. I don't think you ever need like a really long race there. I think a 30 lap feature is plenty entertaining. In my mind. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. And I mean, especially this year with the tire situation <laughs> you may you may not want to be running a lot of long races because there's not going to be enough tires for uh right for that <laughs> yeah that's something to think about there so that that was a pretty good conversation on facebook and of course coming up this weekend again we're we're back we're back just like 2021 bert a lucas oil race we're doing the show it is literally monday right now we're doing the show and the 411 at in, in Tennessee, they canceled the Lucas Oil weekend. And that a lot can happen in a week. I mean, maybe they're, I mean, I don't know. That, that seems like a long ways ahead. I'm not opposed to canceling it like a couple days early, but does that seem like a bit much canceling it like four days in advance? It is. Um, I'll give them a little bit of a pass because. There's a, with it be so so early in the season, a lot of time track conditions can be um, iffy to right. begin with. And if you throw a lot of rain into the situation, it's just not a good deal. But right. Right. Um, you know, we've talked about this at length on on the show. Uh, you know, it kind of started last year where they started doing this, and I mean we're not even halfway through March and they're already canceling races four days before they're scheduled. 
And, you know, I've said before that I, I think that that's going to be a trend that gets worse, not better. Yeah. With, and, and especially, the, especially with all the high money shows that are going to be coming up this summer. Right. And as a driver, I would way rather cancel early than drive there and have it canceled. Right. Because especially, uh, fuel prices are stupid we'll talk more about that in a little bit but yeah so you're probably right maybe the track ain't quite ready yet maybe it's still a little soft they're anticipating rain and they just know there ain't no way that they're going to have a good track and that's a tip of the cap to them because they're also looking at it going maybe we could get it in but if we do they're going to be at a baja and people are going to tear up the equipment and nobody wants to do that um but i think somebody that's going to win on this deal is the world of outlaws are going to Monroe, Louisiana to the rep, right? So they got Friday, Saturday, 10 grand to win Friday, 20 grand to win Saturday. I, what do you think? Do you think that because of this, do you think they could think they could hit 50 over and under on 50 late models at the rep? Um, I'll take the over just for the heck of it. <laughs> oh, you're, you're a good sport. I'm going to take just under. I'm going to go probably about 40. 45 i'm gonna go 45 i think they're gonna have a pretty good turnout because right it's the last dance it's the did you know that the final dirt race the final race probably at the rim so dylan scott who's a country music star has been promoting that the last couple years they put dirt on it right it was paved they things were just not going good put dirt on it not the owner he was the promoter tried to renew his lease what did the owner said don't want to renew it tried to buy the track didn't want to sell it and the owner said nope that's it they're taking the dirt off the track for monday the dirt is coming off the track on monday it is officially the last race at the rev isn't that crazy that it so are they going to run it as an asphalt track or it's just done that just as of right now is just done. They don't have any plans. Like people are asking, and they're like, I don't really know. I looked at their Facebook page. So they were supposed to have the World of Outlaws earlier this year, the sprint cars that canceled, of course, on the dirty south swing. And now they got the world of outlaw late models there. Hopefully, Mother Nature cooperates and they get some racing in. And a lot of people were pretty disappointed. And they're like, and Dylan Scott, the you know, country music guy, he's like, Look, I, I love dirt racing, I want to continue to promote it. We tried to buy it, they wouldn't do it. And it sounds like not a whole lot of people had much good to say about the actual owner of that facility. So hopefully they can go out with a bang and have a good show, a good entertaining program, give it one last hurrah. And that, that's what it is down at uh, Monroe, Louisiana. So let's jump into, Bert, the USMPS Modified Series. They opened up at Rocket Raceway Park down in Petty, Texas this past week in a doubleheader Friday and Saturday. Three classes of cars. A little bit much. They had a pile of them. Went to like one in the morning on Friday. They actually had a instance where they lost power. Right, they were already running late. <laughs> the power went out, and we're going, "Oh my gosh!" Oh, it, it, it was the old was, SK Speedway. The power went out. Yeah, they got it back on though. They did get it back on, but <clears throat> I will say the seventy. I want to say there was 74, 76 modifieds. Hell of a good turnout. Remember, it's a hundred grand to win that deal this year. In every race is five grand to win or better. I think it was five on Friday, 10 on Saturday. But the track was a little bit cowboy up, a little character, especially on the top. Middle to bottom was pretty smooth. The top, the cushion was aggressive. One of those where it would really set the car different directions. So you had to be up on the wheel. And I'm telling you, the, the guy that put on the show on Friday, Bert, because I know you didn't get to watch the USMPS, did you? No, I didn't. <laughs> fat tire boy you need to start watching some modified things, right because it was phenomenal it was absolutely incredible so dustin Sorensen, he had the heat race just we, we don't need to go there it did not go well he had a horrible heat race right so he had to start i want to say he started 12th in the b and he won the b which put him 14th in the feature and he won the feature from 14th it was impressive he was absolutely the class of the field on friday night had hell of a job also on friday night i want to give a shout out to my buddy jason good his dad todd good runs a casino speedway new Minnesota board member jason kind of followed them last year struggle boss learning year 
but uh, got his first top 10. He got 10th there on Friday night, 13th on Saturday. So out of 70 some cars, you know, for a, a guy that's pretty green behind the wheel, pretty good solid weekend for, uh, for Jason. Good. Then night number two, Jason Hughes, who got second the first night, had to take a provisional. Started 25th, I think he started, like deep. He started way back. I'm looking here. Yeah, he started 25th, and he came all the way up to second. Like, he was unbelievably bolted. It, like, really good. And uh, Tyler Davis, who's been following the series for a while, got his first career USMTS modified win. Pretty emotional on Victory Lane, so pretty cool to see a, an up-and-comer. But Sorensen, tell you what, Minnesota proud represent because he ended the year. USRA National Modified Champion in 2021. I mean, he basically cleaned house at the, at the USRA Nationals, and he started the season off right where he left off last year. That 19, Bert, is going to win some races. He is on the pump. He is really good. And uh, another thing I'm going to touch on there is – the, the racing was so good. And again, there was, there was character on the track. I'm not saying we all want a rough track where you're going to destroy stuff, but it was enough to where you couldn't just rail the top and be way faster. It was one of those racetracks, Bert, where the bottom was pretty good, but if you hit the top right, you were going to have a run, right? But then the next lap, you're going to like hit the rut, push a little bit, and then the bottom it was one of those type of tracks. So you had to really be up on the wheel, and what impresses me is Jason Hughes is not, not one of the spring chickens. He's an old guy. He's been racing for a while. He's been doing this. That's uh-huh. not the kind of track that you, you typically see one of the old dogs, you know, hammering down on. It was pretty fun to see Jason Hughes um, leading now the USMTS series. So good racing overall down there. A little bit of a rough weekend for Ramirez. He didn't have the, the defending champ. He didn't have a good weekend. And uh, Dan Ebert kind of struggled. He did get ninth the second night, which is pretty solid. The first night, he qualified really well. He started up front, and he just things just went from bad to worse the first night. So I anticipate Dan Ebert bouncing back, but we'll, we'll see what can happen. I, uh, I kind of picked him to maybe win some races this year. I think he's still going to, but he needs to get – he needs to kind of shake that one off and be ready for the uh, King of America at Humboldt coming up in a couple weeks. So with that said, Bert, World of Outlaw sprint car action. And I know you got to watch some of that. So they were down at the Cotton Bowl. What stuck out to you? Uh, I mean, once again, uh, pretty good racing. Uh, You know, I'm still surprised at uh, how they can maneuver those cars through traffic and, and, uh, Sometimes, you know, it seems like they have absolutely no chance to catch the driver ahead of them, and those cars can make up that distance and really quick. And, uh, you know, like I said, I, you know, I've watched more sprint car racing the last couple of years than I had before. So, uh, good shows. Um, uh, Brad Sweet still can't find victory lane. Uh, he, he had some good finishes, but, you know, just can't get the victory. <laughs> yeah, he was third the first night. He had like a long stretch, five or six nights in a row there on the podium. That ended on Saturday because I think he was, what, six, seven, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, was he in the top five? I don't know if he was in the top five. He wasn't in the top three for sure. But uh, night number one went to Buggy Bobby, Sheldon Ottenchild. What a sweet movie put on for the lead, too, kind of a crossover diamond you know, kind of type deal. And then Carson Macedo kind of stole the thunder from Sam Haferteep Jr. on night two, who led really the lion's share of it. But uh, Macedo was the class of the field the second uh, the second night there. Now, this coming weekend, they're heading to California. They ain't raced there since 2019 because of COVID, right? They, it's actually been shut down. So they got a six-night swing over there. Friday and Saturday, they're going to be at Thunder Bowl, and then they got four more nights of racing after that. So finally, good to see them back out there because there's a lot of sprint car guys from California. Brad mm-hmm. Sweet's one of them, right? I think Macedo is he, isn't he from yeah. out there? So yeah, I, mean, I I picked Sweet and Mas- I picked the California. Guys oh, you picked the California races. boys. Yeah, I picked David <laughs> Gravel to double up. Right? He's he's got. I'll, I'll take the deuce. So I have a question for you though. What sticks out? Is it there's something historic that happened 
at the Thunder Bowl Speedway. And I'm going to look here. It was 2004 that it happened. Do you need a clue? Yeah, probably more than one. <laughs> All you need is one, I think. We'll find out. We'll find out if you're an expert. Ray Everham. His wife raced there? His wife not only raced there, Bert, his wife is the only one. Aaron Proctor, now Aaron yeah. Everham, is the only female to ever win a World of Outlaw Sprint Car feature race. And she did that. She was actually the rookie of the year in 2004, but she parked it in victory lane in 2004. I'm like, I didn't even know that. I was looking back at the past winners of the race. I'm like, wait, what? Aaron Crocker, are you serious? So, yeah, so she got it done there in 2004. Kind of an interesting deal. I, I, I never knew that. So kind of a kind of a cool deal. Anything sticking out? Like, what are you excited about for that swing back to California? Do you think, uh, do you think the California guys are going to dominate the swing or do you think it's going to be somebody else? Well, I mean, I picked two California guys, so I'm hoping they win the first two races. <laughs> but if you already, I mean, uh, I mean, Sweet's got to get it to victory lane sooner or later. That's why I keep picking them because it's just like it's like when you're at the casino, you it, you don't want to stop <laughs> betting because it's going to happen sooner or later. Yeah, and about the time you quit picking them is when he's going to start winning. So right. <laughs> do him a favor, quit just just quit picking them. So <laughs> we got a fan question of the week, okay? And it kind of relates a little bit to sprint car racing brought to you by our friends at Blue Line Brews. So if you support the, you know, support the police like we do, like we're racing fans, you know, we're patriots, we're people that believe in our country. They support those people that support us. See, a proceeds of that coffee goes to the families of fallen officers, to the families of injured officers. They got K cups. So if you're a coffee drinker and you support the men and women in blue like we do, Check out bluelinebrews.com and order yourself up maybe the Detective Special or Justice or, or one of those uh, blends, and uh, you'll be glad you did. So the question we have, so I'm going to kind of lead in like this. So I think we agree that the World of Outlaw Sprint Car Series is not just a race, right? It's like, it's a spec. It's, it's an event. And the announcer, John, Johnny Gibson, is phenomenal. I mean, he takes a race and his enthusiasm, his knowledge, his energy, to me, makes it that much better, right? The driver's introductions to the play-by-play -play and all of it. Would you, would you agree that he's one of the best in the business behind the mic? Oh, I would definitely agree. Um, he, I mean, honestly, I, I don't know if I've heard of an, heard an announcer with his type of style. Um, I mean, it kind of shows you how good he is that when back in 2020, when COVID was running wild and um, they had those eye racing, uh, when they had the sprint car eye racing, they actually brought him in to announce the eye racing races. Really? I didn't know that. That's yes. <laughs> nice. And, and what's crazy is that eye racing stuff, Bert. I'm going to be honest, like, on my phone, it's not it's not huge, right? But on my phone, there's been a couple times where I was clicking and I'm like watching cars go around. I'm like, it took me a minute to realize that, wait a sec, that's not actual racing. <laughs> yeah, I, maybe my eyes were blurry. I'm not really sure. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this now. So the question came in, we understand the importance of a really good announcer. A really good announcer, a good sound system can enhance the whole entertainment value but there's other positions at the track that historically have been entertaining as well, right? Back in my dad's age, right? Way back when, yes, dad, I'm saying you're a little old, okay? But the fact is, the, uh, the flag men used to be like on the front straightaway. They used to wave the green flag and jump back in the infield on a tire. I mean, they were absolutely nuts, right? Because that, that was insane. I never got to see that, you know, which is probably good. I probably would have ran them over. Maybe, um, but the fact is, of an animated flagman in the in the flag stand, kind of the two to go deal, and how they wave the flags. That's entertaining. That's showmanship. Some flagmen are just kind of they wave the flag, and some of them are super animated. And what other positions maybe at the track is something that historically to you stuck out, and you're like, you know what, that was kind of part of it. That was kind of fun to watch. 
Well, uh, it's not the case anymore because uh, drivers have race receivers. Uh, but before race receivers, one of the favorite, one of the things I looked forward to about going to the Wasota 100 when I was at Cedar Lake Speedway was watching how they would line up the cars after, during a caution because they'd have people on the track. They didn't just stand in one spot. The cars kept moving and they kept backpedaling, pointing where the cars should go. And it was just fun watching them line the cars up. I think Jamie Nutsman could run faster backwards than I could run forward. <laughs> I remember him scooting backwards on the track. So Don Hankey was a front straightaway guy at the hitting raceway. My buddy Flex was a front straightaway guy at the Proctor Speedway. Chops, which is Dick Christman's son, was a front straightaway guy at the Superior Speedway, right? So you think back, that was a that was a big part of it. So <clears throat> I get it, right? We have race receivers. I get it. Or drivers do. I, I don't anymore but drivers have receivers but it wouldn't cost much to have that person out there it just adds to the show i'd like to see that person come back what do you think i mean yeah i mean what what, what would you have them do though same thing because let's let's face it drivers are a bunch of piss ones i was one I know, <laughs> right the yellow comes out and all of a sudden they put you back behind the person and you're like that's bullshit i know i'm supposed to be adding them that, that the person can be out on the track and point at them and just kind of being animated and you can you can make a show of it, right you know they can they can still be directing in fact they could be you know they could be like assisting the person that's in the judges booth that's being the, the person lining them up they can be down making sure also another purpose for them Bert, two things one is safety I mean oh, how right. times have we seen you know or maybe as a driver, I'm driving around the track, right? And all of a sudden, we're like, the bottom is straight swine. There should be somebody, like, you can stop and wave that person over and say, look, hey, turn one and two's got to be packed in a little bit more. Or, hey, there's some debris over here in three. There's a purpose for them, not only just for show, but I think there's still a purpose to have that person out there. And I get it. They got corner guys. But let's face it, a lot of corner officials now are in, they're up in, like, you know, bird bird nests right or bird cages like way up in the sky you know in my mind the corner workers should be like up in the judges booth so they can overlook the whole track they shouldn't even be down there because you can't see quite as much anyway so i think there needs to be some people on the track that are kind of doing that job but then i'll add one more thing to this <clears throat> is um you think of some tracks i remember the deer creek speedway i remember going down there in the super stocks the yellow flag would come out and their rule was when the yellow comes out, you just get single file. Chris Steppen has this rule too. You get single file. You just get behind somebody. Just get in line. We'll figure it out. You just get in line. Don't be three wide, four wide. Yellow flag gets out. Everybody gets single file. And I remember they had officials, all the corner workers were dressed up nice. They looked sharp. They had Deer Creek Speedway apparel on and they'd be bam out in the corners and they'd be lining people up and they'd be doing their thing. And they looked like they belonged, right? All the officials had like uniforms on. And then you go to track B and the officials got like ripped sweatpants and dirty t-shirts. And it's like, what in the world? It looks like you're freaking hillbillies. Like what, what is the story here? As a fan, is there a, what's your thoughts on, on officials looking the part rather than looking like, they just got it done crawling out from underneath the car. Well, I mean, officials should definitely be wearing something different than the general people who are in the pits. Because, I mean, if there is a problem, I mean, it doesn't even need to be on the track. I mean, say there's a medical issue or something. I mean, you want to be, you want to know who the official who the officials are at the track, who has the radio, you know, that can call for help or whatnot. I mean, um, you know they should look different than, than the people general public at the track. And, and just from a professional standpoint, it, it is more professional. If, I mean, you don't have to be all decked out in, you know, uniforms and stuff, but at least have, um, you know, uniform shirts that are different than uh, everybody else. And, and honestly, I wouldn't mind seeing all the officials. It used to be a rule back in the day, the lighting wasn't as good 30 years ago as it is now. 
I mean, half the tracks look like you're racing in the daytime, right? But having white pants on, you uh-huh. know, with the uniform shirt, because they're the ones out there. They, I mean, it's a little bit brighter. It's easier to see them. There are some blind spots on the track where it's maybe a little bit darker. In a perfect world, I'd love to see all the corner workers, the flag man, white pants or uniform pants and a uniform shirt look professional, look the part. I think to me, that's that's just another part of the aesthetics of the track. So when fans come in, they're like, hey, we're at this. This place is impressive. We're at a facility that is worthy of us being here. And I think that's just a part of the show. So, Bert, let's jump into the next segment here. A little bit of uh, who's hot and who's not. So let's start with let's start with who's not. Who do you got on who's not? Um, I'm going with um, Brad Sweet because he is winless yet. <laughs> that's a good one, and he's not leading the points right now, which is kind of rare. He's won it the last couple of years, so that's that's a good one there. Brad Sweet due for a rebound. He's probably going to win this weekend. I got Turbo Tyler Herb, um, Bert. Three of his last six races, he didn't make the feature. Didn't even make it. Didn't qualify. Six of his last six, he had to go through a B main. He has been awful. Awful. I mean, he was where he was at Smoky Mountain, and I think he got like 11th. He's terrible. He got lapped. He was junk, right? And and I'm telling you what, I'm, I'm surprised by that because he started out speed leaks with some speed. He kind of looked pretty good, and then he just went, Garbage, straight garbage after that. So Tyler Herb is absolutely due for a little bit of a rebound. Maybe he needs a little bit more water in the track. We'll find out. But uh Turbo's who I have. Who do you have on who's hot? Uh Brandon Overton with two wins and should have had a second. Um, except he blew a tire. Woulda, coulda, shoulda. If the queen had balls, she'd be the king. Why? Well, if if the queen had balls, she'd be the king. <laughs> so I'm going to go in the late I'm going to go two I'm going to go in the late model world I'm going to go with Dennis Herb Jr um, he He's, he, had he a, was second he was second on my list yeah he had a great speed lease he had a first and a second I think last year was about the best world of outlaw season he had he had a few wins last, a couple for sure I think he's going to I think he's going to win some races this year let's go over and under on on world of outlaw series well, let's just go over and all, over and under on wins on, on Dennis Herb Jr., I'm going to go with seven wins this year. Are you going to go over or under that, or or even? Well, he has, what, two, three already? Three. I'll go over. Over over seven. So seven or more, I think he's off to a good start. So the other person I have in the Moz, Jason Hughes. Now, easy to say Dustin Sorensen. He had a good weekend, too. But Jason Hughes with a pair of seconds. And, and he kind of had a couple years, Bert, where he was there but not there. Last year he was pretty quick, and this could be the resurgent of the 12 car in the U.S. MTS Modified Series. Keep an eye on that blue and yellow number 12, kind of my favorite color back in the day. So let's get into our Sure Bets of the Week, brought to you by J. Schmidt Real Estate in Watertown, South Dakota. If you need commercial, residential, land, any of those real estate transactions, the sure bet's called Jay Schmidt. Four racers, buy racers, um, 20 years in business. He's got the track record, huge racing family. Give Jay a call. He'll take good care of you. But this week coming up, a lot of racing coming up here. Who's your lock of the week? Or what is your? Could be what is or who is your lock of the week? Uh, Brad Sweet will get a win in Cali. Brad Sweet will get a win in Cali. Hmm. Yeah, maybe. I got David Gravel, which I'm stuck in high tit in the point, so you're probably right. So if you're leading and I'm not, I don't. Uh, I haven't gained many points in the last few weeks. <laughs> I yeah, I I have lost. I've, I've been you've been gapping me a little bit. So my lock of the week. So I was originally, and <clears throat> we talked about this. I was going to go with. We're going to have 45 or more cars, late models at the Rev. Um, That was going to be my lock of the week. But, boy, it's a tough one here. It's a tough one because I don't want to pick the same thing that you just did. I definitely don't want to do that because 
I didn't pick him in the picks. So I'm going to go late model action. And God, I don't even know if he's going to be there. And I, I, the whole, the whole swap with 411 canceled through a monkey wrench in my lock of the week. Cause my lock of the week was going to be Jonathan Davenport winning at the rep. I'm going to stick with that. JD is going to win one of the two, if not both, in Monroe, Louisiana this weekend at the World of All. That's what I'm going to go with. JD. So let's jump into the last lap brought to you by Zuli's Race Engines that time of year. We are literally just chomping at the bit to get racing in our region. Drivers, if you don't have your engine yet, if you're, if you're just finally getting some money, tax money coming in, give Frank a call. Get your stuff either fresh and get some new stuff. Already a championship under the belt for Zuli Race Engines this year. They got feature wins under their belt as well, and they haven't even been racing at home. All you got to do is look at the Zuli Race Engines Facebook page, and you'll see all the wins that they get every single week throughout the season. I'll tell you what, the fastest way to, to get ahead of one is to just get one, get a Zuli's Race Engine. So with that said, Bert, um, Humboldt this past weekend, or this weekend coming up, they were supposed to have the battle at the bull ring. Huge, huge beam. A lot of Wasota guys head down to the battle at the bull ring. Um, it's a USRA, basically a USRA B mod show. I think it's 10 grand to win. That got postponed and the a big US MTS race, which is the uh, King of America. So that got pushed out two weeks and they're going to actually run them in conjunction. Them are going to be some long, long nights because there's going to be a pile of cars as long as there are tires for them. So another thing here, NASCAR this last weekend. I know what's a dirt show, whatever. I know you watched NASCAR in Las Vegas. What stuck out to you? Um, well, one thing that stuck out to me is, uh, and he would have had another top, 10 finish if he wanted to hit the wall late in the race but uh eric jones is putting a uh 43 car in the top 10 i think he's been in the top 10 pretty much every week and he would have been in the top 10 last week uh except he hit the wall he blew a tire and hit the wall late in the race uh but there's been some other drivers that are you know not with the top teams that have been uh running really well and i mean that's good to see i mean that's what uh nascar needs is some of these uh lesser known teams to be uh running near the front i've seen some people complaining on facebook about oh the cars are spinning out they're on top of the track they need more grip but i'm looking at it and going wait a second i want the cars to have less grip right i want there to be more driver input in the car rather than just like getting a steering wheel holder that can just mash the gas and hold on it looks to me like they finally got to drive these things. And I think the cream rises to the top. And we're, I think there's a lot more parity right now. Like the lower budget teams, like you're talking about, they're actually contending. They're actually, they're competitive. And they, I don't feel like they have been in recent years. What's your thoughts on this whole tire deal? Um, well, it, it's kind of frustrating. Well, it seemed like they could, uh, this last weekend, if they got a flat tire, they could move afterwards. But the first two races, it seemed like if they, if you got a flat tire, the tire would just spin, but you wouldn't be able to move. So, I mean, that, you know, you, you can't get to the, you can't, you're going to lose laps because you can't get to your pit. Yeah, they were talking like, you know, we're, they're going to stop on the track, and tow them in and haul them in and all that. And like, you go to Bristol, how many laps down would somebody be if they got a flat in Bristol and had to get towed in? They're racing mm -hmm. the over, right? So they're going to have to do something with this tire issue because, I mean, I get it. If you get a flat, you're probably not going to win, but you shouldn't be, like, completely out of the race. So, I mean, do they freeze the field? Do they – I mean, if somebody gets a flat, I mean, they can't really do that because if they're running six laps, eight laps, waiting for somebody, they're burning up fuel. I mean – it's kind of they're going to have to fix that tire issue because I think it's something that is going to not be a good thing for NASCAR. Yeah, and I mean the tires have always kind of disintegrated if you're driving on a flat one. But uh, I don't I don't know if you watched the end of the race, but uh, Bubba Wallace, well, he did hit the wall, but uh, I mean his his entire fender was gone because the tire 
shredded and it just tore up the entire fender. So I don't know if the fenders, you know, if the bodies are weaker than they were on past cars or, or what, but I mean, that fender was just completely gone. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw that. It's interesting. I, I know that's been a big talk in the NASCAR world is fixing that tire problem. We'll see what they figure out. How was the crowd? Was the crowd good again? It looked like it was a really good crowd. Yeah, so that the popularity is there. You know, I'm, I'm a dirt guy, not an NASCAR guy, really. But, I mean, I like all racing at the end of the day. So, good to see the crowd maintaining over at Las Vegas. Speaking of tires, so Jeff pointed this out. And we this is something me and a few buddies have been talking about as well. So, clearly, there's a tire shortage. There's Hoosiers documented, American Racers documented it. There's going to be an issue getting tires, okay? Now, add on top of that that fuel prices are ridiculous, right? I mean, diesel prices in some areas, five bucks a gallon, right? So what is going to be the biggest deterrent between those two as far as cars and fans getting the racetracks? Is it going to be the, the tire issue, the fuel issue, combination of both? Which one do you think is going to have a bigger effect? Um, well, I think it's going to be a combination of both. I mean, I think the fuel issue is going to be something that you need to consider consider for the fans also. Uh, yeah, are fans going to travel as much to um, races outside of cer a certain radius of where they live, or are they going to stay closer to home and just you know watch the the weekly races? I mean, I mean. I I'll admit it, you know, I was planning to do a little bit more traveling to watch races this summer, but I mean, depending on what fuel prices are, you know, I may still go to the races. I may have, I may call friends though. And Hey, you want a carpool, you know, split the cost. You may have to do uh, some innovative things like that. Um, I mean, uh, I filled up with gas today and it was 409 here and, you know, we're only in March and, you know, normally the high, pr the high price of gas doesn't get here till May or, you know, June. Well, um, speaking of innovative things on gas, so maybe you're going to have to resort to getting a five gallon can in a hose, right? Just kind of blow in. And, <laughs> you know, I remember back in the day when I was first starting to race hobby stocks, a guy by the name of Vic Westerland, he would race in Grand Rapids in the hobbies and he would literally after the race, he would siphon the gas out of his race car and put it in his truck to drive home, right? And I remember he would actually take the battery out. So I lock your fuel caps, everyone, because now's the time, you know, people might be out like siphoning gas tanks right now. If they're not going to pay five, six dollars a gallon, there might be some issues. So you're right on the money. So is there somebody, we talked about this with uh, COVID over 2020. Are the streaming platforms going to continue to be on the rise because of this um yeah I, I would think so um you know with the price of fuel so you know if the rate if you can watch the race on if you can stream it it's like well you know i don't need to drive two hours to go to the race i can just you know sit in my air-conditioned house and you know watch the race so um it's definitely something um, I think it will become more popular with, with some fans. And I think this is where culture comes in, right? Because the tracks that have a huge, good, like local culture, they're not going to feel a big effect. The ones that have to rely on outsiders coming in to filling up their grandstands, they're probably going to feel it worse, right? So all these special events, they rely on people coming from out of town to fill the grandstands. The local weekly program, there used to be a day, Hibbing, Minnesota, had such an amazing racing culture that if no out of town drivers showed up on a regular Saturday night, they had a fantastic show without any real out of town drivers. You know, I'm talking outside of 20 miles away. Now, they, they got to get some out of towners there to kind of fill in the fields because the car counts are low. Same thing with the grandstand. So I think now promoters got to look at this and go, look, we got to build the culture in our community because people will drive three miles, but they might not drive 50 miles. So that's something that they got to uh, really, really focus on. Well, this here might force them to do that. And I think it's, you know, we 
talked a lot about how this is going to be the summer of the high paying special, all these high dollar specials. Um, and now with, you know, what's happening with fuel prices, you know, if these specials are relying on crowds, you know, is this going to hurt the crowds and have an impact on how successful those shows are? It's going to be interesting. Speaking of the high paying shows, well, some more shots fired, right? What is your thoughts on the obvious tension between Barry Braun with XR and some of the other promoters in the dirt late model world? What's your, what's your thoughts there? What, I mean, he kind of well, made a comment. Do you have it written down? He kind of posted something on Facebook this past week. Do you remember, do you have it in front of you? What do you, what he said? You can uh, even I, I, I don't have it in front of me, but I can paraphrase it. But, uh, I just want to say, I mean, I don't know Barry Braun, you know, I've never spoken to him. Uh, but I mean, I, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious that, uh, you know, the fact that he scheduled over some shows, you know, last year and, and whatnot that, um, he wants to make a name for himself or, you know, he wants people to know who he is, who, what XR is and, you know, more power to him. Um, but yeah, I mean, we talked a few shows ago about, uh, the drive home that the uh, guys on uh, dirt on dirt had and how they kind of made you said it, it was kind of a shot at Not kind uh, of it, they were throwing uh, some darts. <laughs> there, there's no doubt about it yeah shots were fired yeah and so yeah i i saw this i saw uh, xr's post on facebook and i sent you the text and i said shots returned um yeah i mean uh barry braun said something to the effect that you know how can the other series explain the low pay that they've been paying for all these years? And now, um, you know, there's all these high paying shows. I think Money just falling from the sky. <laughs> I think you can call this the XR effect or something like that. Right. Right. Yeah. There, there's definitely, and you know what, I, again, I, I've dealt with Barry just a handful of times myself and, I, I've kind of been the guy that like so I'll, I'll fire some shots at people myself, you know. So there's a certain part of that that hey, he's trying to say shake some things up, and there's certain parts of that going you don't necessarily want to burn every single bridge though doing it, you know. So you, <laughs> and I don't know that he cares. He might he might be like I really don't care. I'm burning bridges. I don't care. I don't need anybody. And and hey, that's that's the beauty of the world we live in is we got the freedom of speech and. The person, if he's going to go make it happen, hey, that, that's a great thing. We'll watch a lot of racing. Well, and I mean, and this leads into our next topic is, I mean, you can't deny that what XR is doing is not causing reactions by other organizations. I mean, what um, the Castro Flow Racing uh, Night, what they just announced it, I mean, that's exactly what XR is doing. And, you know, they're going to uh, pay $75,000 to the champion if they have perfect attendance at all their events. <laughs> and there's only 12 shows. And, and the best part with that Castro Flow Racing Night in America, it's always in conjunction with something. It's not on top of something. So drivers don't really have to make a choice if they're going here or here. It's like, that's it. They're, they're, not, they're not scheduling on anybody. So... I think you're going to see some drivers follow that. You can possibly see, you know, Ricky Weiss. You can see Jonathan Davenport, um, Marlar. You know, the, going to be some of these guys, maybe a Brandon Overton since it's only 12 shows. Maybe he follows that deal. He didn't last year. But 75000 to win for 12 shows? That's, I mean, really? I mean, that that's pretty, that's pretty outstanding. And I think, I'm telling you, that – one one thing here always is like the butterfly effect, right? One thing that you do over here causes a whole slew of things that happen over here, and and he's shaking things up, and uh, he might burn some bridges, but there's going to be some drivers hitting some big paydays because of what's happening. So it's kind of fun to see what happens the rest of the way. We're only in March; a lot of racing left to be had. Right. <laughs> well, speaking of uh, you know the purses being red hot, Bert. Third hauler fire of the year. There was two at Speed Weeks, right? So I don't know if you saw that. So over at uh, um, Clarksville, in Clarksville, Caleb Ashley, um, 602 crate driver, 
his generator started on fire. I don't know if there was a gas leak. I don't know the whole details, but it went up in flames and they got most of it out. He put a big post out thanking everybody that kind of stepped in. Nobody got hurt, thank goodness. But uh, he did go on to win the 602 crate feature um, right after that. So hopefully he's got good insurance on that because they will cover that. He's got good insurance. But, man, I, I don't – I mean, maybe we're just more connected. I was talking to my buddy John. He's like, I don't know if this is – are we more connected now or is this happening more now? I mean, when's the last time you heard of three – hauler fires in like less than a month's time i haven't <laughs> i had a hauler fire driving on the highway one time i i was driving on the highway i was actually going to go up to winnipeg but i had to go to ogilvy first for a, i think it was a i don't know if it was a um advantage rv race maybe and i was on my way down there and it was just me and my daughter and she's like hey something's burning and i'm like hmm what's that I, I go to hit the brakes. It went right to the floor. Gone. I'm like, oh, my God. And I had the, like, a, like a, almost like a cruise control type deal on. I'm going on the highway, and it's, it's literally right in the middle of uh, road construction. And I'm like, this is terrible. I'm like, well, I'm going to have to get off at the next exit. I'm like, Whitney, you're going to have to hold on. So I literally, I slowed it down as much as I could, and I started to downshift. And I went up the off ramp and the light was red and there's cars there. I'm like, oh my God, we're going to kill somebody. I had to drive half through the ditch, jump back on the road, went down the side street, ran the red light, didn't hit nobody. I don't know how. Boom, boom, boom. Both right rear tires exploded on the hauler. The whole back of the hauler went up in flames in the middle of downtown Hinkley. I'm going, oh, God, <laughs> terrible. Needless to say, we did not make it to Winnipeg. That, that did not happen. But nobody got hurt in that one either. How, I don't know. But them holler fires can be pretty sketchy. It's crazy. I haven't seen that many. So another thing, I didn't did – you, you, did you know Jimmy Johnson is racing Indy cars? I knew he was dabbling in it last year. He was racing occasionally. Um, that's all I knew about it. Yeah, so it looks like he was at St. Peter, Petersburg. And what I saw online – it looks like he's going to run a full schedule. He's going to run, you know, they said he's going to run this at the Indy 500. I, I guess I didn't even know that he raced Indy last. That, that shows, like, we follow a lot of racing, clearly not IndyCar. And here I'm thinking Jimmy Johnson retired. You know, he's going to try his, maybe in the booth or whatever. And now he's racing Indy. I had no idea that he was doing that. So I guess uh, I have to just kind of, I don't know if I'm going to watch all the races, but I will pay attention to kind of see if he proceeds. It'd be kind of fun to, see if the old 48 can find his way to victory lane in an open wheel car. Um, good luck to Jimmy Johnson. So current standings, I don't even want to talk about the current stand. <laughs> so Bert's at 28, Jeff's at 25, Cook is at 23, I'm at 18. My buddy Mike joined us here this last week. Bert, he got both of them right. He picked both winners. <laughs> I'm like, you shitting me? So he's at four. Right. And so I'm like, I'm at, I pick, I've been in every pick. Puka, like you said, he ain't even picked every race and he's five points ahead of me. It's like, I'm supposed to be good at this thing. I don't know what the hell the deal is here. So we're going to find out this weekend. I got, uh, we're, we don't have the same people on the World Vault Law Sprints. I'd have to look back to see what I put down for the World Vault Law Lates. I think I have JD for both. I'm going to stick with that. Um, I have uh, Dennis Herb Jr. and um, B Shep. Yeah, I, I got JD for both. I was thinking, I was, I, I actually messaged Devin Moran on Facebook. Let me see if I heard back from him yet. I, I have not heard back from Devin Moran. He has texted, he has messaged me back on a couple other things, but so it looks like he hasn't been online in a few hours yet. That's no excuse. If he was going to go, I was going to go ahead and switch on over to Devin Moran, but no, no luck there. So with that said, Let's close it with this. What are you most looking forward to this week? There's some other regional late model stuff, too. The big ones, of course, are the Rev and, and the World of Outlaws Prince. What sticks out to you? Uh, Racing-wise, uh, with action on the track, I am looking forward to the World of Outlaws Sprints back in California. Um, I'm interested to see what the crowd is. I, I mean, after two years of not racing there, I'm assuming – it should be jam packed um, with uh, with fans, so I, I'm curious to see that. Um, and locally, um, on Saturday, I'm going to. There's a 
a race car show in Clintonville, Wisconsin, oh. um, which is about 20 minutes from Shano. So uh, there'll be um, hopefully a lot of a lot of cars on display. So I'll kind of get a uh, kind of get me revved up for the season to start. <laughs> This week here, I'm a Minnesota guy. I'm a northern Minnesota guy. I played hockey. I, I was better when I was really young than, than when I was in high school. Puka, big hockey guy. It's it's like a national holiday in the state of Minnesota. The, the Minnesota State High School Boys Hockey Tournament is this weekend. So I'll be watching that. Um, Hermantown, of course, Keith is a big Hermantown guy, our sprint car expert. And so I know he'll be tuned into the Hermantown games. Obviously, I want to see I want to see the outskirts people, the towns from out of the cities win the tournament. I'm absolutely 100 percent dead set against any city's team winning the state tournament. It just is what it is. This week, if you're from the cities, I'm sorry, you suck. It just is what it is. OK, on the racing world, I was blown away when I saw that it's going to be the last dance at the red. Right. Because literally they just came on the map a couple of years ago when Dylan Scott took it over and literally the announcement came out like just a couple of days ago, we did a little Facebook live. He's like, the rumors are true. We're done. So I'm, I'm interested to see a, how many drivers, I know Bobby Pierce is making the trip down there. I don't know if you knew that. So he's going down. So there I'm, I'm anticipating a good car count. Hopefully the weather cooperates, but I'd love to see that one go out with a bang. And, and really, I mean, being that this might be the last time we see a dirt race there, I'm definitely not going to miss it because it's kind of a bummer. Anytime you see a dirt track disappear, they come on and all of a sudden they're gone. That, that's a real, real bummer down there. So I'll be watching um, at the Rev here this weekend. Of course, I'll watch the World of Outlaw Sprints too. So with that said, any closing thoughts there, Bert, before we uh, sign off? Um, just uh... – we have our first uh, local racing cancellation for this weekend. <laughs> oh, you do ice racing or what? Uh, no, I, uh, actually, uh, Golden Sand Speedway in Plover, Wisconsin. That's uh, an asphalt track. They were supposed to host a uh, enduro race there this weekend. Uh, but the track is underwater and the parking lot is a sheet of ice. And I guess inside the grandstand is just all ice. So they have canceled the enduro race at Golden Sands. Probably a good idea. Hey, another <laughs> thing I saw on Facebook. So you heard of Les Dolman, right? So remember Les Dolman from over in Winona? He ran the zero car. You remember Les? He ran late models and mods and he builds dirt duelers. So his dad had a huge, like a, um, like a museum um, at Elmer's Auto Salvage. Oh, and, I, and, yeah. Yeah, he's been telling me for years, hey, you got to check this out. It's like super cool. It's their last year of, of having it. And they're actually going to like auction everything off or whatever. So um, when Mississippi Thunder has the Dairyland Showdown, that 50 grand to win weekend, on the 7th, I believe, they're going to be open for tours on that day. So race fans, get that on your calendar. From what I understand, you don't want to miss it. I'm going to make sure I check it out because – I like that kind of stuff. It's kind of cool to check that out. So I'll be doing that. So with that said, Bert, always fun talking racing. And uh, we got a lot. We got The season is just getting underway, and I'm chomping at the bit to get things started up here. But I'm Ryan Aho. That is the Bert Layman. Thanks for tuning in to the One to Go Show.